my name is Cathy Payne. I am the uh, one of the program managers with the All Ireland Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care, and I lead on the kind of education website area of the institute. So this is really a very very brief introduction to the workshop, and hopefully, um, to to kind of set the scene for today and to get you all thinking. And um, we are going to be asking for some audience participation. It's not all just about sitting and listening. Um, so really the aims of today are to explore the opportunities to improve the education that we deliver in palliative care across graduate programmes, to consider how palliative care principles can be further embedded into both undergraduate and postgraduate curriculums, to explore opportunities for palliative care education collaboration. And actually the, um, the whole inspiration for this workshop was coming from yourselves, from people um, working within uh, academia saying, you know, can we not be, we're so small, can we not be sharing, learning from each other and not constantly reinventing the wheel? Um, hopefully we'll be able to highlight some examples of good practice in palliative care postgrad education and some of the developments that are happening within the sector. Um, so we are keen to explore what's already going on and also to review progress um, with the implementation of the palliative care competence framework as a basis for clinical training. So there is the competence framework within the South of Ireland, there is a competence framework also within the North of Ireland, and actually uh, the South used the Northern Ireland's competency and, and made it slightly better, I have to say. Uh, Dory and I were involved in the competence one uh, in our Northern Ireland. How long ago was that, Dory? A long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Too long for us. Uh, so. The really the questions that we're wanting you to kind of hold in your head um, today are how can we improve opportunities for competence-based interdisciplinary education which meet the needs of the full multi-professional team and how, we, how can we support collaboration and resource sharing within the palliative care postgraduate education. Um, and I guess, I mean, my background is actually as a, as a dietitian. So I, I have been working as a lecturer with allied health professions for a very long time. And I, I guess from a personal perspective, I know how difficult it is for smaller professions to get the training that they really need. Um, and you know, in reflecting on these questions, some of the things that I'm thinking about from my own perspective is the fact that there are some shared common competences for all professions working in palliative care, but equally there are profession specific ones and how can we ensure that both of these are adequately met? What is the role of profession specific practice educators? So within nursing, you've got some really good um, examples of preceptorship within nursing. So you know, it's not just expected that people learn in a classroom and then go off and do. There is a lot of, of practice support um, and the same within uh, medicine, but what about those other professions and how do we meet those needs? You know, if courses are interprofessional, is there ever a reflection on who is in the room in terms of the, the um, students that are coming in to a master's programme? So what consideration is given to the mix of professions, is that something that is considered? Is it something that can be considered if we're talking about a course that's about interprofessional learning? And also when we're thinking again about those smaller professions, um, is there potential within the island, we are very small, um, for specific higher education institutes to be taking the lead on, on particular professions where they are smaller? Um, we've, we've seen examples of where courses have failed because there just aren't the students to be able to maintain courses year in, year out. So what are the opportunities? How do we meet the needs of different professions? So that's really all I wanted to say at this point, just to set the scene. And what I'm going to do now is to pass over to my esteemed colleague, Professor Philip Larkin. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I, uh, I think this is a very important meeting. We've, we've the Institute always said we would try at some point to bring together uh, third level or university level providers to talk about some of the issues and challenges about palliative care education on the island of Ireland, island of Ireland. And um, so I think this is it's important that we start this dialogue. 
part of my role today is to help us work through the, the questions that Cathy is posing there. Two of those questions, the key questions, are actually written on the agenda for you, so you don't need to remember them, but I will come back to them. Um, in, in uh, one of my other roles, actually, uh, within the university is I'm actually the Associate Dean for Graduate Studies within my college. And that has been certainly an interesting eye-opener in terms of how the, um, the machinery of academia works, or doesn't, as the case may be. And that is a very important issue, I think, um, for us in Ireland, on the island of Ireland, because we have to understand how, how the academic system works if we want to affect change. And that can often be the, the stumbling block that inhibits us doing what we might philosophically think is the right way to go, but actually when you try to do it in practice, it doesn't work out. So um, on your programme, I think they divided this in this talk into two, where I was going to talk about the world and then Europe, but actually I didn't get that. So uh, <laughs> it's basically a single presentation and at the end of that, then we can have some, uh, some comment and debate. And I'm really just flagging up some issues which I think are relevant for us to consider. So I have no solutions at this point. I'm just really getting us to think about some of the, of the issues. So really, I suppose what I'd like to try and talk to you about is, you know, where are we actually now, generally speaking? And where are we going? Where, where do we see ourselves going to over the next, say, five to ten years in terms of academic education? Um, what are we doing well? I think that's very important because for many of the countries I visit in my EAPC role, they see Ireland as a beacon of education because we've been doing it for a long time and we're well established. So a lot of people want to come here to see how we do things. And then there's always that question of scrutiny when people come and look at what we're doing and you know we think oh my god you know if we can make it sound wonderful but when they come and see it in practice is it as wonderful as we think um, and what could we do better and that's really about that sharing of resource and then finally what next and I think the reason I have in my picture which isn't so clear but it's basically of a runaway train and I'll refer to this metaphor from time to time is that we're I think in academic circles we're often at risk of a runaway train mentality, which is basically, I'd like to run a course on X, I can put that through and away we go, without any foresight as to how that fits within a bigger picture. And that's because universities, although we would like to think of them as, as bastions of education, are businesses, okay? They are there to educate people and there is a cost. And so we can never forget that the cost base is important in how universities do things. The most important document people have to deliver to me if they want to run the programme is not the course curriculum or the, or the philosophy of the programme, it's the business case. Because if I don't see the business case and I do not see the financial plan, I'm not interested. And that will be the same for all the universities. So we need to think about that if we're looking to affect change. But this run up, we, I see it sometimes when people come and they want to run a particular program around a really particular thing. And I'm saying, well, how many students will you have on that in five years time? OK, so, you know, is, it may be OK to run a program now because it's really good and it really meets a need. And, and some of that runaway train, and we're seeing it a lot at the moment in with the HSE, is this business of tendering. So what they're doing is they're putting out calls for tenders for programs because they see a service need, but the long-term picture of those programs is not clear. And that causes, and then of course, because of the way the systems work in a university, they don't fit with the timelines, but we can talk about that later. So if we look at some of the horizon scanning, um, a, a, a sort of a global picture. I said that Ireland is very good, but there are some really good examples of good palliative care education internationally. Um, if you look at, for example, Makerere University in Uganda, they have a very good program there, which is run by Professor Julia Downing. It's a very well established, they're, they're moving to a master's, they're not quite there yet. Um, but there's some, some really good examples of what I like to call culturally specific education. Probably what they do in a master's program in Uganda in Makerere is somewhat different to what we would do here, but it meets that need. It works well for that population. The other project that many of you are probably aware of is what we call the, hello, how are you doing? You're very welcome. Hi. Want to grab a chair? Is there a place? There's a couple of places up here. That's fine. I'll keep going and then we'll get to, to meet you later. <laughs> um, 
So is the, some of you will be very familiar with the LMEC project. So the LMEC project is run out of the City of Hope University in um, California by Betty Ferrell. And basically it is a generalist palliative care education program designed at relatively undergraduate level or bachelor's level, but with it moving towards specialist thinking, which has gone viral, it's gone global. And, and thousands and thousands of people have taken this this program. Now, there's probably a couple of reasons for that. Number one is it has a, 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 a very, very um, skilled and uh, capable person leading it. Okay, so Betty Ferrell is quite some lady if you ever meet her, and she's very well able to sell this program. So people want to go and do that program, and I think it's, it's a question we need to ask ourselves. What attracts people to come to our various centres to do a programme? Is it the quality of the programme? Is it because it's got a name attached to it? And people think, well, it must be a good programme because that person's involved, which isn't always the case. Um, but it's, it, there's some very, very good YouTube stuff around this programme on, on how it's actually transformed practice. And that's a particular issue, I think, in palliative care because a lot of our education has been about developing people to do a particular skill set of work with our patient population. So there's always a very strong clinical focus. There's, generally speaking, this is not like doing ancient Greek. People have to be able to deliver something with their hands at the end of it. Um, and that's, that's, fairly, that, that's challenging then when we look at, well, how do we marry the theory piece with the practice piece? And how do we do that? Um, and generally speaking, if you look at our practice programs across Ireland, we generally do the same thing. Um, you know, what we teach and how we teach it and, and the clinical practicums are very, very similar. We're a very small island. So there are other examples at the worldwide level. Um, Australia, for example, they have the Palliative Care for You programme, which is very, that's really an education programme. PC, I can never, I never get it right, PCC for You, it's called. And that has a lot of education training stuff on there. The issue about that is it's, and, and this is maybe an Irish thing, we like the piece of paper at the end of it. Okay, we like the piece, we like the title, I've done the masters. That's very important to us. The reality is for other people that other countries, that's not so important. It's the training that they get that's important, that enables them to do the piece. So there's a big debate there between training and education about what are we actually trying to do. And I think some of the challenge that we have is trying to separate the mentality of academic education with training for practice. Um, I said that people like to come to Ireland, but there as if you look at the map of Europe, this is just I've just highlighted some of the countries on this particular map where they have very very uh, clear education around palliative care. And one of the trends I see in Europe, which we seem to struggle a little bit with here is multi-professional education. It seems to me, because I teach, I do some teaching in Italy, I do some teaching in Spain, I do teaching in France, all of those countries have palliative care programs where they have a complete multidisciplinary student cohort. Doctors, nurses, physios, OTs, speech and language, all in the same room, doing slightly different things, but they're all coming to the program. And the question is, generally speaking, we don't. We don't have that cohort of people. It's a question for us to consider. And is that because, for example, our programmes in this country generally tend to come out of nursing faculties and therefore people put a mentality on it, well, it's only designed for nurses and therefore it doesn't. And maybe that's true. Maybe it doesn't meet the need of the other groups. I think that's some of the point that Cathy's trying to, uh, to do. And the other place that the other thing, the other fallacy that we always assume is that everybody on this side of Europe, Eastern Europe and beyond the FSU and this, um, the, you know, this former Soviet Union, is basically backward and doesn't really know what they're doing. And actually, you go to places like Hungary and Romania and um, the Czech Republic, and they have some amazing programs around education. Some of them have been sponsored internationally. So generally speaking, education programs over in the Eastern European region, and I say that very loosely, have been sponsored by agencies, for example, the Open Society Institute, the George Soros Foundation. Um, there's a very there's a program at the moment going on in Armenia. George Soros is originally Armenian. 
So there's a big program of learning going on there. There's a program in Georgia at the moment. There's another program going on in Uzbekistan, I understand. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day. So the thing is, people are picking up on this. Now, some of it is coming, which is very interesting. In countries where palliative care is just establishing, what the message people have got is the first thing you need to do is to train the people to deliver the care. So the, po the politicians are making sure that the money at that point goes into education and training, not necessarily the building of the palliative care unit or the staffing to go with it. It's about the training piece. So for us, that's very good. But the, that's another question then about where all that goes. The other thing then is about this idea of collaboration. Some of you may be familiar with OICA, you're familiar with the European Palliative Care Academy. So this really looks at leadership in palliative care, but I'm giving you, it's run out of, this is Professor Boltz, you can't see him very well there, Raymond Boltz from Berlin. Um, the reason I'm showing you this as an example is OICA is a collaboration between universities. So it's a collaboration, I'll get this wrong now, it's a collaboration between uh, Germany, Poland, King's College in London, and I've forgotten the fourth one. There's four countries involved in it. And basically the students do a module in each country and it's accredited by the university in Germany. Now that's, that isn't, they're not the only place that do that. I know, for example, I, was, I did my PhD in Belgium and the University of Louvain used to do a master's in bioethics where the students did a module in Florence, did a module in Leuven, they did a module in... Um, I think again in Berlin, and they did a module in somewhere in the, in the Netherlands. And they were at the, each university accredited each module, and overall they got their masters or whatever. And it's an interesting model, and it's a question. I think it ties a little bit into the point that Kathy's making about where you have the smaller groups, and you're thinking, well, is there is there a case for a whole program within that area, or could a university take one of those modules? credit that module and that module can then be part of a, of a wider master's <coughs> program. So OICA is, they, they take people from all over Europe, they apply for the program, they go through the program, it's a year's program and at the end of it they come out with, I, I don't know, it, it's not, it isn't, it isn't designed as a master's program, um, but, it, um, but it could be and in fact they're looking at should they go down that road, that road of actually giving people a formal qualification? And it's in, it's in palliative care leadership. It's an example of how it is possible to collaborate across universities without too much difficulty. It's perhaps not been as easy in Ireland for us to do that for a number of reasons. I'll talk about those later. So I mentioned about the multidisciplinary education and there is, we can, we can clearly see if it's about competence, if it's about standards of what people need, we actually have some of that information. So this is a paper about competencies for social work. This is about psychologists. There's one here about physiotherapy. This, paper, this journal over here, the Journal of Allied Health, that reports on a really interesting palliative care program, where as part of the program, they, they had, again, everybody around the US program, they had everyone around the table. And uh, as part of the development, they did a 360 degree continual evaluation through the program to see, did it make a difference? And, it fund, and, what, and the 360 degree evaluation showed that it made a huge difference in terms of the outcomes you wanted from a student. So there was a suggestion, because one of the challenges that we sometimes have to question is, if we have a group of multidisciplinary practitioners, should everybody do everything? Or do we have some system that allows people to do some things and not others? So an example I'm going to give you is the King's programme, which is a, certainly seen as a gold standard. Everybody does everything. So if you're a music therapist, you still have to do the symptom management module. And there would be some view that says, well, that's a waste of time. What's the point of a, of a music therapist doing a module on symptom management? They've no science background. It's, they're going to struggle with that. But actually, they could focus much more on the psychosocial. The problem is, when you make the award, it doesn't say this person's got a master's in palliative care. But by the way, they didn't do the symptom management module because she's a music therapist, full stop. It doesn't say that. So there's, there, there are things to think about in how do we make sure that a qualification at master's level does reflect that? And should you have strands within a program that allows people to do very specialist things and still end up with the same award at the end. 
Um, we could be bored to death about competence. It seems to be the buzzword around the world. Everyone likes to know if we're competent and we're very good at writing documents. We've got some beautiful documents. They're gorgeous. They look really lovely. And I have to say, we have done an amazing job in this way in this country. The one thing everybody says to me when I go out there with my EAPC hat on is, ah, the Irish competence framework. <laughs> because it's the one of the very few that has looked at has, has really looked at that broad it was a, it was a it was a, a light bulb moment when someone decided to do that and it really has helped a lot of those a lot all the countries i mentioned earlier georgia uzbekistan they're all using that little document as just to understand what competence means which i think is really very helpful um, and we, 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 we tried, there's a, pay, there's a couple of papers here, some of you be familiar, led by uh, Claudia Gamondi from Switzerland, and I was involved in it. Can you, can you have some core competencies? So it doesn't matter what discipline you come from, are there core competencies that everybody should aspire to? And they're good in the sense that they are somewhat top level. The challenge is within each of these, enhancing physical comfort, meeting psychological needs, etc. You've then got to drill down and the drilling down is where the problem comes because that's when you start to see this division. So what a social worker would need to know about psychological and social needs would be very different to what a nurse would need to know in some cases. Or certainly a chaplain might have a different view on that. So the, the, the challenge of some of these larger core competence documents is that they generally tend to be very top level and they don't necessarily give us um, the detail that we need. And then you have the other added challenge, and we have this uh, particularly in Ireland, well not particularly in Ireland because it happens in other programmes, is um, where you have to then get your wonderful academic programme that's been accredited by the university, equally accredited by a professional registration body so that people are allowed to use that in some way to do practice. So as, a, as an ex I'll give you an example of this. We've had a debate in UCD as to whether or not within the nursing school we need to get accreditation for our programmes from the NMBI, which is the Nursing and Midwifery Board of Ireland, because it is a it is a teeth breaking event to try to do this. It is beyond painful and it's horrendous. Everybody has. I spend my life on the phone to the NMBI with problems. But the problem is that the HSE, the HR departments, will not allow people to come on programmes unless it's got NMBI accreditation from within the HSE. So they're not interested about our academic programme and whether it meets academic rigour. What the HR departments who sanction people to go on programmes through the directors of nursing, they're looking to see has it got NMBI approval. So the problem is often we look at things with two lenses or two lens, two lenses, lenses, yes, lenses, one lens, two lenses. And that can be problematic when we're trying to develop education because it's not just about what we do as academics. It's really that how do we blend it in with that other piece? So these are, these are helpful. But I can guarantee you, if I put that to the NMBI, it wouldn't even begin to tell you that, that it would be sent back immediately because it would not have anything like the detail that they would look for. And there are lots of, I've written a, a thing here, just I'm not flashing my own articles, but I'm just putting it up there because it's there, about the whole issue of competency. And we do need to think, I mean, one of the challenges that people have when I visit other countries around competency is that it sometimes becomes a paper exercise and people get absolutely swamped in paper. They get you you get they get lost in the well what is it we're looking for because they get so stuck into I've got to fill in this box, I've got to tick this and say that people are safe to practice. So it gets very, very difficult for people to take a step back and say, is this person a safe practitioner in the field that they're in? And the other challenge is finding people to do this. Generally speaking, in nursing, it's not so much of a problem. You can usually find someone to act as a preceptor. But if we had somebody from OT or we had somebody from spirit, uh, um, physiotherapy, it would be much more difficult to find somebody who would be willing to act in a preceptorship role or to assess somebody's competence in that. Um, I think, Kevin, you've had a lot more success than most of us have had in that. But it is there's a lot of work involved in trying to do that. Um, and so people get lost a little bit in the signposting around competency. And then, unfortunately, the, 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 the challenge is that sometimes that competency piece becomes a whip with which the organisation can whip you if you're not doing something right. 
Um, and so the competency becomes a barrier rather than what it's meant to be, which is a, a, a platform from which you actually display your expertise. So there's always a challenge when we look at competency as the key issue here. Um, so I think that's just, it, we can't get away from it because it's what we're responding to, I suppose, what is a health service or health system need. Um, just going back then quickly to the, the time, European, yeah. the European trends, we're doing all right now, we'll waffle on. Uh, any questions, anybody wants to I'll just keep waffling on and then you can, we can talk at the end. Um, there is obviously a move towards the whole area of e-learning and digital technology and particularly the idea of online education. And there's various ways of doing that. Quite a few programs, Australia, for example, has some really, really good online resources for education because it's a big country and people live all over the place. And it really works quite well. Um, generally speaking, and this, uh, this is, I suppose, and I could only speak from a personal perspective, and I have this argument with our educational technologists all the time. I believe that there are parts of palliative care that you can teach extremely well online. And there are some bits that I believe you cannot teach. Now, that's my view. The bit I find difficult to do through online is the communication piece. I am old school and I prefer to watch somebody in front of me do the teach, show, show me how you do this. I know they can do, you can do it online and there are ways of doing it online. But generally in, in my university, we tend to favor a blended learning approach where people come in for workshops. And I think there's something about that student body coming together and sharing, even if it's only for a couple of days within each module. Um, the reality is the pressure from the provider who sends the students is that these are not, you know, the shorter, sh short and sharp is what people are looking for. And the, the days of long face-to-face -face programs are really gone. And probably that's not a bad thing. And generally, if you look, certainly um, I teach on the Masters in Palliative Care in, in, in Lleida, in the north of Spain, and um, their, their programme is literally all online, except two day, a two-day workshop that they do in the university where I come, and that's it. Everything else is done online. They don't, there's no other face-to-face -face at all. And that's, uh, you know, and that's partly because the students are coming, having already done a graduate level program in palliative care, and they're doing a top-up masters. The other question then is, is the profile of people coming on our programs. So when we first started, we have, next year we have our 21 years of palliative care education in UCD, and I hate to tell you, I was teaching the first program, so it's time for me to hang up the boots. Um, the reality is that in those, the people who came then were people with a huge amount of clinical experience. They were very well, very versed in the field of palliative care. The people we get today are quite different. They come with a completely different skill set. They may not have, I mean, originally, I remember we used to say to people, they had to have a minimum of five years in palliative care before we'd let them on the program. Now they're there, they finished their general training and they're coming to do the program. So you've got a different cohort of people coming. And of course, the other thing across the EU is we're unique in some ways because we talk about specialist palliative care. Most of the people that are on these programmes in other countries are in a generalist context. They, palliative care may be a subspecialty <coughs> of palliative medicine, but for most other disciplines, it isn't even recognised as a separate part, a separate qualification. So although they have this thing that says they're a Masters of Palliative Care, in their discipline, it may not be recognised. And they come with very wide ranging generalist backgrounds. Interestingly, I see more people coming from ICU backgrounds, more people coming from acute medicine. Um, we still get some people from acute from primary care, but perhaps not as many as we used to. But the number of people who are coming from specialist palliative care, generally, if you look across, is, is less than it used to be. We've already touched on the allied health professionals, and it is a point. I mean, I do, I am, struck by the fact when I go abroad and I see these programmes, how they have all this multidisciplinary issue and people, people, everyone's in the same class and it doesn't matter. I could be talking to somebody and they might be a palliative physician, they might be a, a registrar, they could be a, a nurse, they could be a chaplain, they could be a physiotherapist, but they're all learning, they're all learning in the same way. What could we learn from that? Um, the reality of higher academia is that it is a minefield of hell. Really, that's the only way to describe it. Um, 
you know, we when students come, they really don't know the blood, sweat and tears that people have got to to get that program up for them because they think it's all just dead easy and we just sort it out. And it's the same in all the universities. Um, so particularly for disciplines where they, are, where they don't have an extant department. So I'm fortunate my school is a school and that being, there's a difference between being a school and a department. If you are a school, you have a voice. If you are a department, it means you belong to somebody else and therefore your voice may be lessened. And for some of the disciplines, they have no voice at all <laughs> because they, they, they're literally a very, very small number of people. Um, but, you know, the, the, the challenge of getting academic universities, they, they will talk the talk of innovation. We like innovation. We want change. We want you to go out there. And then you will try and you will find it's like pushing sand up a hill because there will be, ah, well, we have to look at this and then there's that. And, oh, well, you've missed the deadline for this, so we have to wait another year. As somebody said, universities work on the speed of reverse, reverse speed of light. So it's, you know, it will never happen. So these are challenges that we, we have to face going forward. And the other thing then we have to think about are the, if you like, the other people who we work with. One of the things I've noticed in a number of programmes, particularly in France and Spain, is that they have healthcare assistants and volunteers taking programmes. And that's very interesting. So there isn't this idea, oh, you can only do this programme if you are a professional and you're going to get a registrable qualification which will allow you to practise. These programmes are seen in a much broader way. And that what the volunteers, I sat in the lecture where a volunteer presented on the role of volunteer in palliative care to the students. It was, it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. And this was an older lady. She had, she'd, she'd obviously got a degree many years ago, I believe, but in something completely different. And there she was contributing in, in an enormous way to the learning of the whole group. And I think that's a challenge we need to think about is... How far are we about that higher education learning and deepening, or are we just about an end product, which is somebody who's out there on the road doing the job? And I think that's that's always the the, the challenge that we have to think about. So I, I'm seeing different educational interventions, evidence of the wider community, clearly evidence of partnership across universities, where they, you know, there is, and it may be one or two people are working together to make that happen. It's not that the universities suddenly love each other because they're in competition because it's all about money. So not all about money, but money is a key issue. So, but there is partnership. The other thing that's been quite helpful, and I have noticed that, and to some degree, I think we're good at it too, if you look at our clinical program, is what you might call the national strategic plan. So some of the countries that I visit, they have a good national strategic plan for palliative care and education is firmly based within there. So somewhere along the line, the messages have got through. If it's not in the national strategic plan, if palliative care is not on the table, that causes some problems. And, um, you know, we're, we're fortunate because I think that we are at the table. We need to optimise that in terms of how we work better together. Um, I've talked about uh, integrated levels of learning and I've talked about lifelong learning. That lifelong learning is huge. You know, we, we always say to the students, you know, you come to do your master's and what I'm doing is you're preparing you for your PhD and they go, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> and, but theoretically, that's what the university, the master's was really only ever designed to get people on a thing so they could go on and do a PhD because you know, we, I think the challenge for us who work in clinical practice roles is that we see the PhD as the pinnacle of success. But for all the, everybody else, the PhD is the door in. You can't actually get a job as a lecturer in a university if you do not have a PhD in the South. I'm not sure if it's quite the same in North. But is that the same in North, Jerry? Yes. Is, yeah, but you, I mean, you wouldn't even get an interview in UCD because if you were coming to do, it doesn't matter what field you're in, the PhD is, it's the, it's the beginning because basically people would do their bachelor's degree and in some cases they would just go straight into a PhD. They'd miss the master's out. Now that's, that tends to be more arts and <coughs> rather than sciences. But even so, you know, if they got a funded scholarship, they may have completed their BSc in chemistry and then they're a research assistant on a PhD funded programme and they're doing that and they come out with a PhD and they come out with a PhD at like 24. You know, so it's but we have a different way. You get the PhD and you think that's it, I'm done. But actually, it's not. It's the other way around. 
So I think we need to think a little bit about our focus. Um, you know, to what extent is our clinical academic education an expression of expert practice? So is what is it that we want our people to be able to do and how do we focus that? At, the, at some level, all of those things we have to teach students. Attitudes, skills, knowledge, behaviour. And in a way, that's the point I'm making about the change of population, the cohort we serve. <coughs> 20 years ago, you probably wouldn't have had as much work to do there because they'd already got some of that from being in the field. Today, students don't. Um, you know, and I, I don't see so much our undergraduate students but, I mean, certainly they have particular attitude, and I'm not sure it's a healthy one. Um, they're very little knowledge and completely no skills whatsoever. So, you know, there's a lot of work to do to get those students to understand what it means to be a physician or a nurse or a physiotherapist, because they have to think in a very different way. And I'm not sure this is just a, a, a lark and moan. I'm not sure our education system prepares them for that. Um, because the first year of education in the university is really trying to get people to learn to think for themselves rather than just regurgitate what they were beaten into them to get the leading cert. And it's, it's really difficult sometimes. What we want, I think, and I've used, you've probably seen this slide before, I mean, this is from a European project I was involved in around nursing, but, you know, we know that our, our students at the end of a graduate program, they need to come out with evidence, they need to know things about patients and families and the system, and they need to know about society and how palliative care fits. And as they go along, and we've got the different levels of ABC or one, two, three, you know, one being very generalist, two being people who need a little bit more, and three being specialist, the reality is they have to grow in that. And the, the thing that the students have to understand is the idea of critical thinking and judgment. They know they, they the thing that always amazes me is they come to do the masters in palliative care and I only speak for nurses and it's like I've suddenly forgot that I'm a registered nurse. I'm, I have to think in this way and I'm saying, well, what would you do if you were a registered nurse on the unit in this particular situation? Forget the palliative care bit. What would you do? And they tell me what they would do as a registered nurse, which hey presto is exactly what you would want them to do as a palliative care nurse with perhaps a slight change. So, but the thing I think that we teach them, particularly in palliative care, is about the wisdom of their critical thinking and judgment. Because sometimes they need to learn to think in a different way, in that more holistic way, in that total pain concept. And we need to get that across to students. That decisions are not just about A and B. There's a wisdom piece that you have to build into their learning so that they're able to reflect on why they do what they do. And to know sometimes when they shouldn't intervene as opposed to should intervene. So just a couple of thoughts about Ireland. Uh, I'm using the island of Ireland here, as you can see. But, you know, at the end of the day, we do have some differences. But the differences are far less than the similarities in terms of what we're hoping to do with our academic education. I think we love our beacons of education. OK, we're very good at our beacons. You know, this idea that we are these great. I mean, I hear it now this week because it's Freshers' Week. So the presidents are all up there saying how wonderful we are and how amazing we are. I was in Trinity College on Monday and I saw them all doing their various stands. And you could, the one I thought was the one about feminist theory, ethics and something else, society, which I thought was very good. And they're all getting their free Easton's bags. Marketing, very good marketing going through. You know, all those sort of things. Are, but every all the universities now are, you know, you chose to come to us and we are the best and we think you're the best and therefore we're all going to be the best and this will be fantastic. And uh, that's fine. And unfortunately, the problem then is that once you get into the system, they realise it's a bit of a fortress because the students, for, for, the, for the students, it's trying to figure out how all of that fits together. For people that we would see, and this is obviously what I refer to as the mature learner, the student who's coming from clinical practice and probably it may be their first foray into academic education. For the young freshers from, from school, it's like, wow, fantastic, you can take it all on. For a lot of our students, it is a fortress, it is a nightmare. I can't get into Blackboard because I don't know how to press a button. And so 
you know, there's no point me going down the road of, and the, the important bit about my master's program is this, well, we can't actually find the right button on the computer. So we have to work at a very, very different level. And let me be very clear, this is multidisciplinary because we've had, we have had uh, some physicians last year who had great difficulty working out where Blackboard was and, oh, I have to download that. Yes, you need to download that before the class. So sometimes there's a bit of hand-holding here that has to go, happens to go on. And that, unfortunately, sometimes puts us in a slightly challenging position with our colleagues in the universities who are used to going in and doing a lecture to 300 students, probably slides that they wrote in 1985, same slides, Possibly not even slides, and then they, yes, flip things, and then which are badly spelt, and then there, and because we still do have the um, the, 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 the projectors, and then we wander out, and nobody has a clue who said what. Okay, not a clue. I say I go to the academic council meetings. It's like something from Harry Potter, because all the emeritus professors come, and you all sit there, and we can't hear because we're 85 and we're deaf, and we have to shout. And you're sat next to somebody from, you know, I'm there representing my school and I'm sat next to a professor of ancient Irish and somebody from the veterinary school, because I'm in the veterinary school, that I'm in agricultural sciences part of my department. Don't ask. Just don't ask. <laughs> and the reality of that is you're fighting a corner and that fortress makes it very, very difficult sometimes, both for us as the, as the people responsible, but also for the student to try and navigate fees. I mean, I could talk for hours about the challenge of sorting out people's fees. I spent hours trying to sort out the mess that people have, trying to pay the university money, and then they won't get their marks. We do have a system. Most countries tend to follow something like this. We might call it something different, but we generally have a system. What we often don't realize is that the system can be used to um, help the student rather than to prevent the student. So for example, in my university, if you're doing a level nine program, which is master's level for the graduate uh, master's in palliative care, you are allowed to have one level eight module. It is permitted within that. Nobody ever tells a student that. Nobody ever tells a student that in the NUI, you are allowed a level eight module on a level nine program. And that means the student could have done a level eight module, which they can get what we call recognition of prior learning for. And then they haven't got to do six modules, they have to do five because they level eight. If we haven't done that in palliative care, now, for example, the program I know that I've seen it in a couple of places is around cardiology, cardiovascular care, and they've, they've done that quite well. And they also involve things like CPD programs, continuing professional development programs, where people can get credit for that within their hospital to build into a graduate program. But we've become a wee bit precious, I think, in palliative care on the island, and we don't allow that because we're concerned that by doing that, we'll dilute the programme and we won't get the expert practitioner that we want at the end. But we need to rethink that because people are much more choosy about what they get in terms of education these days. And they're coming and saying, look, I've spent, I've done this CPD programme, I've got X credits at level eight, why will you not recognise them for the palliative care programme? I can go across the road to the lady doing cardiovascular and she'll recognise them, but you won't. So how open are we to that option? There is an acad I think we're, we're developing academia in this country very well. I think we're doing, we're, we're done. I think it's a little bit runaway train, however, because we've all gone off and done our own things. Um, there are, and then the, the question, of course, is around, there are challenges sometimes around assessment and how we assess people, how we assess their progress. Um, you know, <laughs> it, it's a bigger issue in the undergraduate programmes because the question is, when is enough enough? What do you do when a, can, when a student simply is not able to do the job? And that's why I say to the students when they come, nursing, I speak about nursing, but you could talk about medicine, you could talk about any of them. They're not a theoretical exercise. It's not about sitting here and thinking deeply about the meaning of English literature. You have to use your hands, okay? And what's in here has to translate to hands because you lay hands on people. And if you can't get the head to the hands to the body, that's a problem. And generally when students are not managing that piece, that's when they start to fail their clinical practicums. And some of the work I have to do with the students is when I have to say, uh, maybe this is not the right programme for you. 
because you're not getting there. But the university systems don't like that because they say, oh, no, no, we have to give them another chance and they have another chance. Oh, and another chance. And then we end up, I mean, in my school, we've had to set up a fitness to continue to study uh, group <laughs> because it's the only way that you can get some people out when they're not actually able to do the job. And that's that's a challenge. So just a couple of thoughts for you to think about as we move forward. Is collaboration truly possible? And if so, how? You know, we, uh, it, and I, th I think we know it's fairly common knowledge that UCD and TCD, we tried our very best, we really did, <laughs> to get a joint programme because we thought it was the right thing to do. And it, it did not stall for the fault of anybody in this room. It was a, it was a systems process, which was very difficult because we, there was no way those systems could speak to each other. But we've learned, we found other ways to collaborate. And I think that that's an important thing. There are ways to do it, but how can we do it more regionally and more nationally, if you like? I mentioned the competent practitioner again, just to flag up. So where does that piece of competence lie? How do we how do we assess competence? How do we how are we are we comfortable about what we're doing? Uh, how do we manage it when somebody isn't competent? I think this is very important that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Okay, we've got a lot of really really good stuff there, but sometimes when we feel we need to change, it's almost like we have to go back to the beginning and start again. We don't. At this stage, I think in Ireland we have a tweaking opportunity here. There are things we can move. But some of that means we've got to step away from our old bastions of this is mine and this is this is how we're going to do it. I am concerned that we still have this runaway train mentality that, you know, and that's because we're driven by our local universities. It's not it's not that people are not would not see the value. It's a question of, well, you know, what if I have to get this done because this means students, this means income, income is good for my department. Those things are important. And then the other issue, which I always like this one, is about marketability. So we have a graduate liaison officer in my school, and her job, Mario Flanagan, is the marketing of the programmes. Generally, she says palliative care is not bad because you rattle it in and people come running. They think, oh, we've got to be And they have no idea. They come in and they, you know, really they don't know what, like, what they want to sign up for, so we talk them through. But the problem is sometimes we make it so complicated in terms of what the expectation is. We're not marketing what we do well enough. We market well, people look at what we do abroad and they say, wow, they do some really good stuff in Ireland. So we're getting a message out there, but internally sometimes <coughs> the marketing messages are a little bit unclear. And I see this particularly, not so much in palliative care, but around leadership programmes. If I see one more leadership programme on the island of Ireland, I'm going to scream because everybody is chewing out of the same pot. Nobody has got enough students and we're, we're struggling and yet we're all teaching the same thing. And so there's, somebody's got to have some joined up thinking about this because otherwise you're going to put yourselves outside the market. So a final thought, if we take a really, really hard look at what we're doing, are we ever so slightly unstable? Are we ever so slightly, we like to think universities are that fortress, but sometimes we find ourselves on a little bit of, of shaky ground. And I think it's because we need to start thinking of better ways of working together to establish that, because otherwise things start to lean a little bit and it gets a little bit lost. And so I go back to that. If you go back to those questions, where are we now? Where are we going? What are we doing well? What could we do better? That's what we're here for today, is to have that piece of debate.